Thank you for inviting me. And I can, uh, I will invite you to go to the Pronghorn Center uh, in Baja California. It's beautiful. And they did a great job. It's a gem of a museum in the middle of the desert. It's, it's amazing. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about um, climate impacts and uh, restoration efforts in Baja California. Uh, like Michelle said, I'm a professor at WABC. <clears throat> and also co-founder and member of this diverse group called MESCAL, where we study management of ecosystem across the Californias. We're a diverse group of researchers, professors, and students, and we mostly work on these coastal um, ecosystems. So we work on estuaries, we work on temperate reefs, and we work on rock intertidal. But we not also work on these beautiful, important uh, ecosystems. So we try to do also the connection between these ecosystems and uh, communities. So we know these ecosystems, like you can see on your left, um, our ecosystems or habitats that provide very important ecosystem services that then are uh, benefit communities and communities use these ecosystem services. Then these communities, have an impact or manage these, ecos these ecosystems, and then we have a social, ecolo so social ecological system. So today, first, I'm gonna talk to you about these ecosystems and how climate change is changing them. And then at the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some restoration, local restoration efforts that um, we're doing to try to increase resilience of these uh, social, social ecological systems. So the outline, I'm gonna, like I said, talk about climate change in Baja California, then some ecological impacts of climate change from these coastal ecosystems. Um, then I'm gonna finish uh, talking about, like I said, the local restoration efforts. So we know climate change is impacting uh, us worldwide. This is the um, temperature anomalies uh, of air temperature in Mexico from 1901 until the, uh, 2021. And as we can see in the last couple of decades, we have experienced some of the most or the warmest years uh, in record. If we go more localized here we, on the top panel, we have temperature or maximum temperatures in August for Baja California Norte on the top panel and Baja California Sur on the uh, bottom panel. So from somewhere around 1950 to somewhere around 2010. And as we can see in Baja California in different sites and in Baja California Sur in different sites, we can see about a five degree increase in the maximum temperatures in, in August. So these uh, researchers concluded in this uh, study that it is evident from the temperature analysis in the Baja California Peninsula that there has been a significant increase in maximum temperatures. But not only air temperatures are increasing, we know that the oceans are also getting warmer. So this is ocean sea surface temperatures, um, anomalies again, since 1880 until uh, 2020. And as we can see in the last few years, we have been a dramatic increase in uh, uh, temperature. And also we know that marine heat waves are increasing in frequency, intensity, and duration. So on the left top panel, we have um, the frequency of marine heat waves. Marine heat waves are these episodes in the ocean when the water is uh, above the 90 percentile uh, or the 95 percentile of temperature of these historical records. So uh, marine heat waves are increasing on frequency, how many we have on certain areas at global, uh, global scales. We also know the intensity of these marine heat waves are increasing. So here on the top, uh, I mean, you know, the bottom left, we have um, the degrees um, above the, the average. And we can see that it's increasing also globally. And also we know that, the, or we, we're seeing that the duration of these marine heat waves are increasing. So that how many days these marine waves um, are um, is, is increasing. And just for an, ex an example, here we have maps of Southern California and uh, northern, or the northern part of the um, Baja California Peninsula. And each one of these pixels, the color of these pixels uh, is the number of days of heat wave days that we have on that year. 
So as we can see, 2014, 2015, basically most of the year were uh, categorized as marine heat waves. So we have temperatures at least two or up to two, three degrees warmer than uh, the historical average. And as you can imagine, these higher temperatures have had an effect or had an effect on uh, these coastal ecosystems. So next I'm gonna to talk to you about some of these ecological uh, impacts that we have seen in Baja California in the last few years. Um, so in some studies, we know that at least 165 species responded to these marine heat waves in the last decade. So that means that at least 165 species were uh, expanded range, they increased their abundance or decreased their abundance or were affected by these marine heat waves. So I'm gonna to talk to you, or I'm gonna give you some examples of a um, study that we, uh, which were, in which we recorded these effects of uh, these recent marine heat waves on, on, on some organisms from Monterey, California, all the way down to the tip of Baja, uh, where we recorded um, the effect of climate change on marine, of these marine heat waves on 29 species. So we saw at least nine species that had an expansion or extension of the range, uh, 10 reappearances, seven increases in abundances, two ships into new habitats, and at least one apparent contraction. So some of these examples I'm gonna give you of, of this, of this uh, study. So for example, the uh, black sea urchin. This black sea urchin is typically um, tropical species. Its historical range was from Southern California all the way down to Ecuador. But after these marine heat waves, we found them 362 kilometers north of uh, Southern California in Monterey. So it expanded the range for 362 kilometers. We also been noticing that the, abundant, or the abundance of these marine sea urchins increased at least an order of magnitude in Southern California and in Baja California. So these urchins were not here or were, had very small um, abundances or densities and they have increased dramatically in the last few years. And we also, uh, so these uh, new or these um, black sea urchins in new habitats. So doing surveys and work on estuaries in Baja California, we found uh, densities pretty high of these sea urchins inside of the coastal wetlands, which is very very rare. We also have seen some other species like Centrostephanus coronatus, is like this uh, sea urchin with very really long spines becoming a lot more common in some areas in, around Ensenada. So here are five different sites in Ensenada and the densities, how many um, urchins we have, we have at per meter square. And we can see that these species, Arbacia stellata and Centrostephanus uh, coronatus are more tropical species and they're starting to become a little more uh, common. And in some areas like in Playitas, just right around UABC, the university in Ensenada, is basically the only uh, species of um, sea urchins that we found. So maybe we're seeing this tropicalization of these sea urchins in, in Baja California. Another example are crabs. These are crabs in coastal wetlands. I'm gonna show you some data from San Diego, uh, San Diego Bay. We have the Hemigrapsus oregonensis. It's a, a species that has a distribution, uh, temperate distribution from Alaska to Northern Baja. And then we have a more tropical um, species of crab, Calinectis arcuatus, or the arc swimming crab, which has more of subtropical, tropical uh, distribution from uh, somewhere in Southern California all the way down uh, to um, Central America. So in the last few years, what we saw is this more temperate species, well, first the, the tropical species, we saw an increase um, in the last few years and I'm missing some data here, but in the last five years, we have seen an increase of that increase of um, the density of um, uh, crabs in San Diego Bay has remained stable. Um, so this is the tropical species becoming more abundant in these more temperate areas. And the opposite, the species that has a more of a temperate distribution and likes cold water, we have seen an, a decrease on their abundances around in, in San Diego. So these species that have their um, 
sudden distribution limit on these areas might be coming too hot for them and the abundances are decreasing. Another example is Suka princeps, is this big, magnificent fiddler, fiddler crab. Um, it also expanded its range to 245 kilometers um, to Bolsa Chica uh, before it was um, reported or the distribution was all the way down to uh, San Quintin. And we also know uh, from recent trips and from data that is present in Estela Punta Banda and the Tijuana River Estuary. And just to give you an idea of how exciting or how crazy this is, if we look at the pictures of the tropical species Uca princeps, it's a pretty big um, fiddler crab. Compared with that, our normal and typical fiddler crab in Southern California and Baja, which is um, Leptuca cranulata. So you can see how this is like big news for us that like the mud and little critters. Um, Another example from these coastal wetlands is the long-tailed goby. The long-tailed goby has been present in Southern California, typically only when we have like really strong El Nino. So in 88, we were, it was present in Los Peñasquitos Lagoon. And then it basically disappeared from all the Southern California and Northern Baja California. And then in recent years, we, they appear again. And here also I'm missing some of the data from the last few years. But in recent monitorings, we have been finding them and uh, becoming pretty abundant in Southern California coastal wetlands and Northern California, or Northern Baja California wetlands. So we have these species that typically will just show up on big El Niños in years that we have really warm uh, temperature water. But now they're here and it seems, appear, it appears to me that they're here to stay and um, just because water temperatures have been so dramatically warm in the last few years. Another example is the um, kelp forest. So we know kelp forests are, you know, um, ephemeral. They can pop up one year and then disappear, but they typically you have some areas that we have kelp forests uh, for a long time. And we know kelp forests are, provide a very and many ecosystem services. They're habitat for many species. But what happened to a, a lot of the kelp forests that we have in California and Southern California and Baja California after these marine heat waves? So we went from something that looks like that to something that looks like this. So the canopy of the kelp forest disappeared. We had um, sea urchin barrens that eat basically everything and all of the algae that we have in, um, in the area. But also, not only urchin barrens or Barrens uh, form after the marine heat waves. In some areas, we went from a forest of macrocystis or kelp into this forest of sargassum, which is an invasive species from Asia. Um, so we started to figure out like what's, one, what's, what's the effect of having this change on this species and the forming uh, species. So we did some experiments with red sea urchins. And we found out is like most of these invertebrates that are herbivores really don't like to eat sargassum. So this is a gonadosomatic index of red sea urchins, which is just basically measuring or weighing the gonads and the whole body. And you get an index of how good the gonad or how heavy the gonads are. And then we have the different diets that we fed them on different colors. So as you can see on red, um, the gonads of these red sea urchins are a lot uh, lower when we were when we were when we fed them with sargassum pornary. So most likely this change on um, on the species of algae that we have uh, in recent years is probably having an effect on a lot of the herbivores in these areas. And finally, um, we also, as you probably have been and heard in the news. In the last, in the last decade, and, uh, well, there was a very strong, uh, massive die-off of sunflower stars, the Pycnopodia calientoides. It's like the biggest uh, sea star that we have in the world, which is um, common or was common in uh, the west coast of uh, North America. And what we found out since around 2012, basically in a lot of these areas, we have a 100% uh, die-off and disappears of these 
magnificent, ma magnificent um, sea strats. And for example, Southern California and Baja California had a, uh, a die off of 100%. So since then, since around 2014, we haven't seen, and not just us, but other monitoring programs haven't seen uh, any sunflower sisters in, in, the, in the system. It's not necessarily that there was these marine heat waves or climate change that caused this, but it's likely was a denser virus that affected these sea stars. And we know that when the temperatures are warmer, these epidemics can be a lot uh, harder and it will be harder for them to recover. So with that, doom and gloom, I'm gonna pass to the next part of my talk to just show you that it's not all doom and gloom. So um, we know that restoration could potentially increase resilience. So we know on your left, we have the threats that are affecting or are threats to these ecosystems. Obviously these threats are changing and causing problems to the ecosystems. The amount of ecosystem services that humans are going to receive are going to be less. But then communities, what they can do is do management and restoration to, tell the, to, to try to ameliorate these, these threats and the effects of these threats. And we know restoration could potentially, at least at local scales, uh, help to ameliorate and to mitigate some of these changes. So if we have resilience-based management, we could potentially uh, try to increase the resilience of some of these um, local ecosystems to, uh, to climate change. So um, in Baja California, what we're trying to do is a few restorations at very, at very local scales. So we have this program called SPORA, which is um, has been spearheaded by a UCSC student, Andrea Paz, which she was a student at YBC before where we're trying to identify sites to restore kelp. And we're gonna do that uh, with the help of the communities and the help of the state and stakeholders. And the, some of the techniques that we're gonna use to try to restore these um, kelp beds is using green gravel, which is basically we just put little uh, pebbles in the lab, we grow little baby plants of kelp, and then when these uh, pebbles with tiny little baby kelp are ready, we go and throw them on sites that we have identified as good sites. And then we obviously we need to go and do monitoring. So we have some preliminary data and some uh, successes and some not very uh, successful attempts. So here, for example, we have some uh, baby tiny kelp growing on these uh, pebbles that we grow in the lab, uh, growing just south of Ensenada. Um, they ended up dying all because there was too many herbivores, there were too many snails, and they ate them all. So now we know that we, we want to do uh, restoration of kelp using green gravel in these areas. We also have to do removals of some of the herbivores, but we're learning and we're trying to, um, to get more money and more funding to uh, try to scale this up and have more sites and uh, see if it works. Uh, we're also doing some tra uh, kelp translocations. We go on a healthy kelp forest and we grab a few of the juvenile kelps that we have in there and then we put them on sites that we think they're probably going to do okay. So as it's hard to see, but these plants are attached to rocks using rubber bands. Um, and we're hoping that these, uh, they're not plants, these algae are going to grow and they're gonna to attach to the floor and then eventually they can reproduce and then we can have potentially these localized uh, restoration efforts. Um, another one that eventually we hope we can get started to is um, restoration efforts for Pycnopodia, the sunflower sister. Um, as some of you may know, the sunflower sisters are tremendous predators of uh, sea urchins. Um, so in the places that we have uh, too many sea urchins, if we can get back, or we can get some of these sunflowers to, um, or restore these sunflowers, they will help us also to restore these kelp beds. Um, so we're part of this roadmap to the recovery of the sunflower sister. Then we're hoping in the future, maybe you rear some in the lab and then do some um, uh, translocations and put them out and hopefully we'll be able to get sunflower sisters in, in Baja California again. 
And uh, finally, uh, we're also working with um, some communities, fishermen um, co-ops or cooperatives, that they're um, interested or they want to restore uh, some of the species that have been lost either due to disease or in overfishing. So we're doing conservation aquaculture. What does this mean? That we do aquaculture that eventually we're gonna use to, um, to restock and to liberate the, some of these abalone into the wild. So we basically just grow these abalone in uh, these Australian baskets, modified Australian baskets that are usually used for uh, oysters. We put them out on the sea. We uh, grow them for, uh, for some time. And then eventually all of these abalone are gonna make it back into the reef. Um, we, um, we mark them and then we, we do monitorings um, to see how they're doing and hopefully um, in the future, we'll have um, an increase on the abundance of this very important resource uh, for these uh, coastal communities. So with that, I'm just gonna conclude, uh, basically saying that ecological impacts from climate change are likely to increase in the near future. Um, I think we're seeing experience in the tropicalization of Baja California. I'll only give you a few examples. But every time we go out in the field, into the estuaries, into the kelp beds, into the rock intertidal, we see more and more of these tropical species moving north, and obviously that they're going to have an impact on the on the communities. Um, we also know that monitoring programs and species interactions um, studies are vital to record the impacts and inform predictive models, so we can understand what the future might look like and what species are gonna continue to show up up north and this whole tropicalization and how the species um, distribution and abundances are gonna change or potentially gonna change in the future. And uh, finally, adapted management and restoration uh, plans and projects at local uh, scales could help, like I said, ameliorate some effects and make some of these social ecological systems a little more resilient. And um, that's all for today. And thank you for being here and thank you for inviting me. And that's my contact information.